Hello everybody, it's Graham from Unearthed. And if this doesn't get your metal detecting juices flowing, nothing will. Today, or should I say this evening, uh, we're having a detailed look at hammered coins. Now, ever since I started detecting many, many moons ago, <clears throat> I've always had an interest in finding hammered coins. They are my bread and butter of detecting. Some people love artifacts, which I do. But coins, do, you know, they're the, the ones that I look for. If I don't find a hammered uh, out in the field in a day on a day's detecting, I deem it as a failure. Um, probably found close to 600 now, uh, hammered silver, which sounds a lot. But when you convert that into hours out in the field and over the years that I've done it and the travel, it's probably a pretty poor return. However, there'll be one or two out there thinking, well, I've never really found that many and... You know what am I doing wrong etc etc it's just a matter of picking the right land in the right area where the medieval people were thick on the ground and believe me you will find hammered they are out there um, there's plenty of them still out there as I will show you guys uh, in this film but I'm going to go through uh, firstly you know the different grades the different denominations of hammered silver and what you're more likely to find out in the field now when we first started it was mainly this is just a very, very small selection of, of hammered pennies um, and half pennies that I found over the years. Some of these ones at the top are not in particularly good condition. However, these were pretty much run of the mill for me out detecting early days. So if I come on with one of these, I was happy. I was really happy. That was my day complete. Um, but as you're detecting days uh, move on and time moves on you want more and more and your desires for hammered silver become more intense and you start finding other slightly more desirable coinage now um what i'm going to do is <coughs> show you some of these coins if i can these are cut, cut quarters a selection of cut quarters here as you can see a bit of a scottish one there and short cross and Long voided long cross coins. Now, for for those that didn't know this, uh, and there'll be many out there that do know it, so I do apologise for um, preaching to the converted, uh, as they say. But um, these were actually cut from from whole coins. So these cut quarters originally would have been these. So it was four of these to one penny. So that was a farthing, cut farthing. They cut them into quarters, and as you can see, most of them are fairly neat, which tells me that the medieval methods for cutting coins were pretty much, um, well, they're probably more advanced than we give them credit for. Could we cut coins of that uh, straightness uh, now? Mm, we'd struggle, wouldn't we? Uh, we'd be pretty rushed at it and we'd probably make a bit of a mess, but these guys knew what they were doing. They had the snips. I guess, if that's the right word. And they cut them pretty much uh, accurately, as you can see. So, cut quarters. If I find cut quarters, I know my metal detector's working. I found probably 30 in the 30s cut quarters now. But in the early days, we never found any. And the reason is the machines that we used way back in the 80s probably didn't have the sensitivity levels and they probably weren't as good as the modern machines for winkling these out, especially between the iron. But we find more and more cut quarters now than we ever did and the same with cut halves as well as you can see there's a selection of cut halves and again numbers for cut halves is probably in the 30s or 40s as you can see there's a heck of a lot of cut, cut, uh, cut halves here Henry the Third, voided long cross you've got the short cross range at the bottom so it tells you that that period in time they were cutting coins quite extensively and of course it didn't just start in the in these uh, early periods of the short cross i've even got one here um, which dates from the Ed edward the confessor so that's actually a saxon uh cut quarter uh, sorry cut half and there's a, a scottish cut half there i think that's a king stephen cut half and this one here is a tealby cut half henry the second so th you know they cut coins even into the late or even starting in the late saxon times possibly earlier right through i think the the latest was edward i'm pretty sure I'll have, I'll have to look into that but of course as time moved on 
uh, the cut halves were replaced by round pennies or round half pennies. So they went from the cut over to the full rounds, um, which is no less desirable in my my view. People frown upon finding cut halves because they're a coin that's been cut, but they're still a coin in their own right. And I like cut halves just as much as full. Um, going back to the cut quarters, the cut quarters were replaced by the round farthing. I mean, these are really tiny coins. I'm going to probably attempt to pick this up to give you some idea of just how tiny these things are. I mean, look at that. So small. Tiniest, tiny little coin. Uh, not the best example, but uh, at least you guys can see. You know, it, it can fit in my thumbnail. Tiny little coins. And how many of them are out there still waiting to be found? Millions. Not hundreds of thousands, not thousands millions so don't be under any illusion that there's uh you know all these detectorists out in the fields are finding everything they're not there is countless millions of hammered silver still lying out there in fields for, for you guys to go over and find it's just a matter of getting the permission having the patience and having the perseverance to winkle them out believe me believe me now you may think that's a bit of an outlandish statement <clears throat> but when we look down here we're looking at the coins now of Henry III, voided long cross, bar the one on the the right, this one. That's a short cross. But all these, little selection, are from the reign of Henry III. Now you're going to say, well, why is he going on about Henry III? What's so you know what's so special about Henry? That one there, as you can see, it's a blurred portrait because it's been double struck. So whoever struck that with a hammer way back in the 1200s, struck it again. They had another whack at it. So the reverse is quite good, but the portrait side has been hit twice. So, you know, these uh, these guys weren't, uh, it's not, it wasn't a foolproof method, but you can see the portrait of these coins, really desirable coins. I love finding Henry III. But I don't think I find enough of them. And the reason is, because I do some research on coinage. Coinage is my thing. Hammered coins are my thing. If I, Like I said, if I can go out and find two or three of these in a the field in a day, I'm happy. That's my day complete. But when I look into it and do my research on it, I should be finding more. Short cross. So a little selection of short cross up there, as you can see. I should be finding more of them, and certainly more of them. And the reason is, I did some research on the pipe and Chancellor rolls way back in the reign of Henry III. Now, if you look on the British Numis Numismatist or Numismatic Journal uh, from 1970-71, it goes into detail telling you how many of these coins were minted. Now, if I say to you, the mint output of Henry III alone for London and Canterbury in a 20 year period was around 160 million in just London, Canterbury. 160 million of these were minted in a 20 year period, just out of them two mints. That's absolutely amazing. That tells me there is many, many more of these coins out there. If they struck that many, I mean, that's just mind boggling. And of course the Henry III long cross Coming away from short cross, Henry the Third long cross, three hundred million pennies over twenty five years in London alone. <laughs> That's absolutely amazing. Now they've done the calculations. These professors much more uh, astute and, and clever than what I am. But coinage, long cross coinage. These are what we're looking at now, minted in London alone was 60,000 a day. Now you put that into context, that's just absolutely amazing. So it gives you some idea of how many coins must be out there. It's heart, must be heartwarming for detectorists thinking, oh, well, there's all these people showing hammered. I'm never going to get one. There's countless millions out there still to be found. Do not be disturbed 
or deterred away from detecting, thinking you're not going to find anything when there's all these coins still out there to be found. Okay, a lot of them will be under roads and tarmacked over and under de building development, but there'll be still countless, countless millions out in the field. Believe me. So that's a selection of, uh, of the hammer that you're likely to find. Now, if you're very lucky, like I was a couple of years back, or a few, good few years back, I come across this wonderful hammered gold coin of Edward III. Now that's actually a half noble of Edward, probably stuck around, struck around 1350, 51 possibly. Um, it was actually bent when I found it and I got it straightened by um, a goldsmith or a jeweller. But as you can see, what a stunning coin. I was overjo overjoyed when I found that. But you can see there's a slight miss. It's not perfectly round. It's almost like egg-shaped. It's almost given me the impression someone's just took a slither of gold off that edge. But otherwise, it's perfect. Now, when you put that into uh, monetary terms, that would have been equivalent to 80 of them. 80 pennies. 80 pennies made up the gold half noble. So I pro you would probably think 30, 60, nearly three months' wages for somebody. So whoever lost that was fairly rich. He must have been sore when he lost it. A merchant, possibly. But he must have been sore when he lost it. So 80 pennies made up the half noble. So that's just uh, an example of what's out there. The medieval people, believe me, they were careless with their silver and gold losses, because there's that many stuff, you know, there's that much stuff comes up year by year, it's amazing. And of course, you're going to wonder why I've got another little gold hammered here, but this isn't, it's not strictly, strictly medieval, it's a little bit later, but this is actually a half crown, hammered half, uh, hammered gold half crown of James, James I, 1604. Now, if you look at that, compared to the half noble it's huge no less desirable but uh, a lot smaller you know I didn't know what it was when it first came up uh, until I turned it over and seen the king's face but uh, it just shows you what the you know the size difference of, of the coinage in later years now um, another thing that is interesting about uh, some of the coinage is these uh, groats now you can see these three particular examples and these are Edwards um, and you've got the above that you've got the half groats so a small selection of half groats again millions of these were minted I don't find enough of them I really don't I should be finding more groats but my particular area that I detect in is more pennies the good old penny which the peasant had out in the field with him on him most times that's why probably so many are lost the peasants had the had the pennies which is, you know, a day's pay for a peasant, I guess. But if you look carefully at some of these coins, and I'm going to move this to here so I can show you guys. If you're going to wonder where these coins were minted, you can actually read the mint on. So you can start here. L-O-N-D-O-N. So that was minted in London. How easy is that? How easy is that? But I'll show it, turn it around a bit. Uh, I've just dropped a coin off there, as you could hear. Slid it off, L-O-N-D-O-N, -O -N. London Mint. So, you know, that's an easy one. Um, but there's many, many mints. You know, you've got uh, you've got Dover Mint, you've got Canterbury Mint, you've got, you know, Winchester Mint, you've got Carlisle, Berwick, Newcastle, Chester, Bristol. It goes on and on and on. So reading your mints, uh, where your mints, uh, where these coins were minted, the mint marks uh, and the, the mint, uh, moneyers and minters, I should say, can be a tricky job. Um, but uh, you, you will get there if you st if you study them. Uh, Canterbury is another easy one. You'll see it on some of the coins. C A uh, C A Cant C A N T O R. A couple of these will be Canterbury Mint. You can see that one there as I'm searching. You'll see T O R Cantor. That would be C A N there in that little space, which is worn. So that gives you an idea of reading the coins and where they are minted now this one in particular is a particularly nice example if i can just show you guys in fact i'll pick it up if i'm not 
and you can see it's a short cross so this is a particularly nice example i found this many moons ago but it's in really good nick actually when you get that under a microscope or a glass you'll see it's got a hairline crack on his face which is a real shame but you can actually read who minted this let's just turn it around and it's osby so you can see the o s b e the old style r osby minted that a gentleman called osby way back in the late 12th century absolutely amazing that you can still read the people's names on these coin on these coins so fascinating really when you think about it um i mean it just, it just fascinates me i've been lucky enough to find some really rare hammered coins and here's some examples unfortunately these have been sold because the landowner wanted half but as you can see that's one i had a particularly lucky spell um, around about 2010 when i found this which is a half a canute saxon late saxon coin um, that's well unique because the mint and money at the time had never been recorded it was minted in dover by a bogda i think a boger boger um half a canoe particularly rare anyway but to find one with a, a unmatched mint and money was even more desirable and uh, a couple of days after that uh, in a field nearby i found that one which again is half a canute that was minted in london if i remember not uh, not unique but excessively rare so unfortunately they're no longer in my possession like i said the landowner wanted half of the value which you can't blame him so they ended up disappearing but you know still uh, rare coins come my way here's one i found uh, actually this time last year december last year which is a stephen penny now stephen pennies are quite crude as you can see that's actually in quite good condition for a stephen penny um but uh you know to the to the untrained eye you probably think oh that's a bit of a crude looking coin but it's uh it's actually not bad as you can see there he is holding staff stephen in letters across the top and of course one that i found um september just gone which is a king stephen and matilda which is really rare and you can see there's two figures standing there um it's just about there isn't it? he's got a little split there but she's very very rare and desirable coin so you never know really what's going to turn up hammered coin wise um of course you can get the run of the mill saxon coins that come up this is a bit bent and twisted and bit buckled but it's still a saxon uh, confessor penny so you can you know you can find pretty much anything now what i always look out for is this sort of thing look at the size of these chunks of medieval pottery green glaze as you can see there still got mud on it still needs cleaning melanie catches me having this in the house she's going to uh she's going to play hell but uh, she's not here so i can get away with it um, and you can see, you know, that's been a handle off a jug. Medieval. If I'm finding surface scatters with these in the fields, I am pretty much likely to find hammer coin. So keep your eyes peeled when you're searching ploughed land on the surface for this sort of thing. You know, whoever had all of this probably had all of them at the same time. Or probably paid for that jug with one of these. Now, before we get disappear, and uh, I, I do, uh, I do apologise for waffling on a little bit. Some of you guys will know the term half cut. So, if you've been out on the drink and you meet up with a couple of your mates and he's already drunk, we call him he's half cut already. Now, that's the, that's why it's called half cut because one of them, a half cut coin, was enough to get a person merry or drunk in the middle ages and the term half cut has continued all the way to present day so we st still say around here to this day he's half cut so that's where the term comes from if, if any of you didn't know you do now uh, okay folks well i hope that's i hope that's been of help uh, like i said i've got a real passion for hammered silver like i said i must have 600 plus maybe i'll have to have a count up i've got most of them still bar maybe bar a dozen uh, but you just never know what you're going to find out in the field. Big lovely groats, you know, the groats can come up. Four pence, the equivalent to four pence. You know you've got a bit of history when you've got one of these in your hand. But don't be deter you know, deterred. If you're not finding any hammered silver, 
eventually you'll stumble across it. And this is just a small selection of my medieval coins. You know, we're not even in the period to talk about Tudor coins, you know, the Henry VIII and Elizabeth and Queen Mary and James and Charles. So there's, you know, there's many, many different types of hammered silver to be found from half crown, shillings, sixpences, threepences, your pennies. It's just amazing. Groats, half groats, the list goes on. And of course, one day, I might be able to get the noble. That is my, uh, that's on my wish list, the gold noble. So watch this space. If I do find a gold noble before I uh, peg out, I will make sure I do a video of it. But uh, I've got to keep everything crossed for that. So I hope that's been of help and I hope you enjoy this YouTube film. I'll catch up with you guys very soon. Thanks for watching.